Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Ruby. I'm one of the principals of Cyberlight Global Associates. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is some of the changes that I've been seeing in the way attacks have been occurring. Uh, three years ago, I stood in front of the same conference when it was over at the Sheraton in 2012, and I talked about malware analysis, how to look at and identify different kinds of malware. And I wrapped up the presentation by saying one of the new things that we're seeing are attacks that aren't software-based, but are rather are hardware-based. Well, that presents an interesting challenge. When someone starts attacking the actual hardware, the firmware of a system, there really wasn't much in place three years ago to even help analyze that, let alone mitigate that problem. So that's what I'm here to talk about, is what's changed in the last three years, what we're seeing today, and where we are and what you can do about it. Uh, first, a basic definition. A hardware vulnerability is an exploitable weakness in the computer system that enables attack through remote or physical access to system hardware. Now, these kinds of hardware attacks are fairly new. They're a new addition, something that folks really weren't thinking about more than a few years ago. They tend to fall into two different categories. Um, one of those categories is things and their vulnerabilities that may have actually shipped with the product. Um, everybody gets Windows. And then Microsoft says, wait, we found a vulnerability. We're going to issue a security update. And then a month later, they say, wait, we found more security vulnerabilities. We're going to issue an update. And this happens month after month after month until finally there's a service pack, and then month after month after month. And if you're smart, you keep your Windows systems updated. By the way, for those of us who use Apple devices, iOS, same thing. We get updates periodically. If you're on OS X, you also get updates periodically to, to you for your Apple systems as well. So, so the software vendors have gotten used to this model of realizing that new vulnerabilities happen and they have to defend against those. But what about the hardware vendors? When's the last time you heard from the manufacturer of, say, your wireless access point that's at your house? That there's a hardware vulnerability and let's go ahead and update the either operating system or reflash the firmware. Something we don't hear too often. So if I'm an attacker and I can find some of those vulnerabilities and exploit them, that's good for me. And if I also get to know how your, say, D-Link or Netgear wireless modem runs at home that connects you to your cable provider, bringing your internet to your house, if I learn how to attack those systems, either at the operating system or at the firmware level, even better for me. It gives me a lot of interesting opportunities. Um, this does require a more sophisticated attack technique. These things are harder to detect. When they're harder to detect, they linger longer. It allows me to remain present and resident in a network on a system for a much more a longer period of time. That means your data is vulnerable to me should I decide to do something about something with my access for a longer period of time than we're used to in the software world. And of course, it's much harder to remove. First, if you don't see it, how do you remove it? And second of all, if I've done something like attack the control chips on a USB drive, place them into a laptop so that the malware then copies my little piece of code and then replicates that to every USB drive that gets placed into that laptop, how quickly will that move through an organization and how well will your systems find that? So let's take a step back for a second and talk about what everybody's already used to. Um, this is what I call some of the old school hacking, and I, I go back a lot of years. Uh, in the very beginning, it was all about stolen passwords and finding back doors into systems. And for anybody who's fans of some of the uh, older American movies, I, I list some parallel movies where these different techniques feature prominently in the movie. Um, my favorite one is uh, the unauthorized terminal access by someone in the Italian job. And I don't mean the recent Italian job with Mark Wahlberg, I mean the old Italian job from 1969 where they messed up the traffic light system in town to cause traffic jams in very specific areas, allowing them to follow the bank robbers to follow their getaway route. It's a great car chase. It's one of the best car chase scenes in the movies ever. If you haven't seen it, watch it. But it gives you an idea of the power of attacking the hardware. I can get to the system that runs something important, maybe distract you with that problem while I steal what I really want to steal. Uh, we move on to network access later on, you exploiting system vulnerabilities, software vulnerabilities. Uh, we all know about the web servers, web servers that have different vulnerabilities and how you have to keep your web server patched, database vulnerabilities. You go to a website, you enter your name, you enter your date of birth, you enter your favorite color, and it gives you access to something. Those databases are vulnerable to attack. 
and we've moved into the world of offensive tactics. Some of the things that David were talking about. Um, we all know about viruses and worms and Trojan horses, and we've gotten really good in summary at defending against this. Okay? If everybody patches their systems, if we're careful, if we buy good network defenses, if we build good firewalls around us, everything's great. Except for all of that's perimeter defense. What do we do inside? Here's the problem. People like stuff, like their email. And people get email from their friend who says, click this link to see a picture of my dog. Click this link to see a video of my cat. Well, if you have the right software and the right tools, perhaps you're even filtering some of that out. But when someone clicks a link to go to an external website, maybe you're protecting yourself from that level of malware attack. Maybe you're not. Um, we also have direct attacks on the public-facing servers. Um, we have third-party attacks, and this is one that a lot of folks are, are, are getting used to now. The idea that if I go to CNN.com or any of your favorite websites, the BBC, whatever it is, most of these sites are supported by advertising. Don't let me go to CNN to read the news. That's a site I'm allowed to see if I'm an employee at your office, right? Or I go to CNN and part of that little window happens to be an advertisement from some third party. If I'm the attacker, I've learned I'm not going to try to compromise CNN. I'm going to compromise the vendor who provides the advertising. And that little window that pops up, and I even highlighted where it says an advertisement. That site is also going to be requested by you while you're at CNN's page, and it probably actually loads first. Have you ever noticed that, how the ads always seem to load before the content you want to read loads? That's an exposure point for you for malware. We've even gotten good at defending against that. So here's where it gets interesting. People like stuff for free. Nobody likes to pay for anything. So when someone gets an email from their friend and says, hey, the new movie such and such is out. Well, it was a movie that I, I wanted to see recently that I didn't get to see, The Martian. Great movie. Why wait? Click this link and you can see The Martian for free. You may have to download a special viewer, but that's okay. It bypasses all the copy protection and you get to see it. Does that special viewer have any extra, extra little presents packaged in with it? What about software? Um, I use one that's relevant to me. I, I have a wonderful Macintosh. I love using it. I use Office for Mac. Um, but if I decided I didn't want to pay for the latest version of Office for Mac, I could just go out to the Pirate Bay and download a version that's pre-packaged so that the license checking has been modified and it will run for me anyway. But notice when you download, this is what you get. There's even a little skull in the README file. Is that a joke? Is that, is that the person who cracked the system just saying, hi, it was me? Or is there something extra packaged in there that I don't know about? People like free software. So um, I, I show the Trojan horse there because it's, it's hard to keep the enemy out when you have your own users letting the enemy in the gates. So that's something we have to be careful of. We've even gotten halfway decent at stopping this, although it's, it's, sometimes it's pretty darn hard in the corporate environment. But this is where user education has to come into play. What do your users do at home? Do they take one of your laptops from your office home with them? What are they doing with that laptop? What are you letting them do with that laptop? Bad things can happen. I love that picture at the bottom. Okay, so number of exploits are increasing from a hardware vulnerability uh, perspective. Um, it's more challenging to implement, but there are lots of forms, especially on the deep web, of just how to do this. If you want to learn how to write code to corrupt the control chips on the USB drive, and by the way, reformatting the drive doesn't fix that. If you want to learn how to corrupt the control chips on the USB drive, I can take you to the places where people talk about the techniques and how that is done. Um, USB connections, the bad USB exploit, net USB vulnerabilities, those are just two of them. We also have some interesting memory access vulnerabilities. Um, one that I worked on about five years ago, we, we nicknamed the project FDR, um, was the ability to get to a laptop if I could plug into it 
I could find the place in the four billion bits that make up the memory of the laptop, which ones and zeros I need to flip. So if you lock this laptop screen, walk away from it, I walk up to it, plug in my USB drive. Actually, we were doing it with a FireWire device that gave us direct memory access. Control, Alt, Delete. Whatever you type, hit the return key. I would immediately flip the one and the zero in the right place in memory and screen unlocks. Boom, I'm in. Never had to know the right password. The system thought I typed the right password because I directly manipulated the memory. That's turned, that technique, that, that's something that was discussed a lot five years ago, it's been turned into a couple of interesting vulnerabilities where devices plugging into systems are rewriting part of the memory, active memory of your running system. Some of these require physical access to, the, say, the laptop, but some of these things can be done over the network as well. Wireless access points. There are massive, a massive number of firmware vulnerabilities in wireless access points. Many of the brands that are out there, and I'll, I've got a list in another slide, um, they still remain unpatched. These have been reported to the vendor. This is a vulnerability. Yeah, 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 we'll get to it someday, the vendor says. They're still out there. Okay, so even if the vendor releases a patch, People update their, how long, you know, your, the little Wi-Fi things that keep the, the public network running here. How often do you go around and check the firmware and update the operating systems of those devices? Everybody thinks about patching the laptop. Nobody thinks about patching the Wi-Fi. So uh, I, I stole David's uh, little slide that showed the uh, connection between national governments, organized crime, legitimate businesses, and somewhere in there in the nexus between two or maybe all three of them, someone would have the resource to do this. And then, of course, I like the hoodied hacker. Um, maybe a hoodied hacker is smart enough and has the resources to do this. Or maybe it's a first-year university student at Virginia Technical, Technical University in uh, Blacksburg, Virginia. Which one? Which one might be able to deal with the access points and their known vulnerabilities? Here's that list of vendors that I was talking about. D-Link, Netgear, TP-Link, TrendNet, Zytel, probably others as well. But I, in putting the slide deck together, got to over 100 devices that are available on the market today that are unpatched, that have a very specific vulnerability out there. One exploit. One exploit is really easy to access. There's the short piece of Python code that lets me do a buffer overrun. Um, I'm not going to actually display the entire pile of code to you. It's only about twice as long as what you're seeing there. Um, I don't want to be accused of teaching people how to hack into other Wi-Fi devices. I don't want the hotel getting mad at me as you guys start doing this uh, in the middle of the presentation. But what do you think created this piece of Python code with a little bit of, with a little bit of help from a forum uh, that they were reading online? That's my next door neighbor, Claire. She's very interested in cybersecurity. She, I, I told her some places to look. She went and found what she needed to find and then wrote Python code to do it. And I have an old D-Link sitting in my house that I said, here it is, it's on, practice when you want. And yet, she got direct access to it. As an administrator, she, with, with, without, without a password, just by executing the piece of code at the right time. That's pretty powerful stuff. The memory exploits, uh, the DMA access uh, I was talking about, um, anything where you, someone has physical access to your device, did you leave your laptop sitting at the table at lunch when you went to get a new soda? Did anybody plug anything into it when you weren't looking? iOS devices are not as vulnerable to that because most of the access has to be done through a, first of all, you need the special cable. Second of all, you have to deal with the signed driver and, and the signed capability. But if it's a jailbroken iOS device, if you're someone who doesn't want to deal with the Apple Store every time you want an app, well, um, I've got some code for that too. So talk, let's talk a bit about mitigation. What can we do about some of these things? Okay, number one, you need to look at the vulnerabilities in the vendor hardware. When you're making your hardware selection, it's important to know which vendors are really good at doing updates. D-Link is number one on my list here because they are terrible at doing updates. Three years and counting since a vulnerability was reported that permeates a number of their devices and they still haven't done the update. Really, guys? Netgear, TrendNet, Zytel. 
Which ones do the best at doing the updates? And this is true for any of the devices that you buy. It needs to become part of the decision-making choice. It's not, you can't just buy on price anymore. You need to look at the vendor and how well they support what they have. Okay, you need to not just ask the vendor the question. You need to do your own research. Every vendor is going to look at you dead in the eye and say, of course we do updates. Well, how quickly? So you need to check around a little bit. You need to start patching your hardware. Okay, if you happen to have a wireless connected uh, video player, a DVD player at home, like I do, it needs a software update periodically. Um, that particular device doesn't have any firmware to flash, but my wireless access points, I have two of them running in my house, they have software updates and firmware updates. You need to think about running your firmware updates. There was a really bad Apple firmware security vulnerability um, that was discussed a few months ago. Um, to the best of my knowledge, Apple has released a patch for most of the newer hardware, but if you have a really old device, um, there's nothing been released for it yet. Apple sort of said, everything older than this date we support, and everything, old, uh, everything newer than this date we support, everything older than this date, yeah, buy a new system. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate the support on that. Okay, so firmware updates are important. Um, USB devices. The only recommendation I'm giving to my customers at home right now on USB devices is if you're going to let someone else use it, it needs to be disposable. You give it to them, you let them plug it into their machine, tell them to keep it. You can buy these really cheaply. If you don't want to keep it, then throw it away. Don't plug it into any of your systems. By the way, some of the USB vulnerabilities work especially effectively on virtual machines. So if you're running VMware or uh, some such on your uh, virtualization software on your machine and you think because your Windows version is in a VM, you're safe, you're not. Because you can, that what happens is the piece of code gets installed in your version of Windows that will then infect other USB devices. It's there, it's resident, you can't see it, and it just keeps infecting devices. Um, everything seems to be easily, easily compromised. So again, uh, I, I say know your supplier. Um, if you get one of these things free at a conference, I tell people, throw it away. Buy one yourself from a reputable location. And those are the only ones you should be using. Um, and that's pretty much it as far as the mitigation strategies. Uh, there aren't much in the way of what vendors offer today that I have seen that will do scans of the hardware and firmware across your network. A few are starting to appear, but I haven't personally tested anything at this point, so I can't do any recommendations. Maybe next year. Thank you very much.